In August of 1998, New Line Cinema released the movie Blade, starring Wesley Snipes as the titular character. A brief summary, spoilers ahead. While still pregnant, Blade's mother is bitten by a vampire and gives birth before she turns, leaving him a half-vampire, half-human being with all the strength of a vampire and none of their weaknesses. Except for, except for the thirst for blood. He, he still needs blood. Uh, together with Abraham Whistler, who raised him since he was a teenager, Blade hunts and kills vampires in a search for revenge against the vampire who killed his mother. After a literal bloodbath, or I guess a blood shower, he saves hematologist Karen Jensen, but not before she gets bit. Then a race against the clock for her to find a cure for vampirism before she turns, and before Blade succumbs to his thirst. While all this is happening, turned vampire Deacon Frost is inciting unrest and rebellion among the vampire community as he searches for a way to awaken a blood god, and as it turns out, he needs a daywalker's blood to complete the ritual. That's Blade. So Frost attacks Blade's hideout while Blade's away, kidnapping Karen and biting Whistler, who kills himself to avoid becoming a vampire. When Blade goes to rescue Karen, he's captured as well, and it's revealed that the vampire who did not actually kill, but had instead actually just turned Blade's mother, is in fact the very same Deacon Frost, who begins the Blood God ritual only for Karen to escape and free Blade, letting him drink her blood for strength before he kills all of Deacon's followers, including his own mother, and then injects Deacon with Karen's cure, causing him to explode. Karen cures herself, helps Blade with his bloodthirst, the end. <sighs> Anyways, Blade is a great movie to watch if you're interested in science fiction, vampires, action movies, superheroes, black superheroes specifically, um, revenge storylines, or if you just really like Wesley Snipes. It took the action hero format of the 80s and 90s and transformed it into the supernatural superhero genre that we know and love today, all while being about a black man who is a vampire, characteristics not typically associated with the good guys, and certainly not with heroes. That simple speculative question of can a black man be a hero led to the genre-defining blockbuster trilogy that is so beloved by audiences even to this day that it's getting a reboot. But something important to note is that Blade was not always supposed to be a vampire. In his initial comics runs, he was only immune to vampires, but not a vampire himself. It wasn't until Blade, the movie, came out in 1998 that the character officially became part vampire. So what happened between 1973 when Blade was first created and 1998 when the movie came out? Well, among other things, in 1991, Jewel Gomez publishes The Gilda Stories, which is notably also about a black vampire. Now, of course, there are some significant differences between Gilda and Blade. Gilda is a runaway slave who grew up in the 1850s. Blade is an orphan who grew up in the 1970s. Gilda is a fully turned vampire. Blade is only half vampire. Gilda is a lesbian. Blade is not a lesbian. But of course they do have similarities as well, other than just their blackness and vampirism. One major point is their parental figures. Um, they both lose their biological mother at a young age. Gilda's mother died shortly before she runs away from the plantation. Blade's mother dies in childbirth, although she does later come back. But more pertinent are the white parental figures they gain. Gilda is brought in by the other Gilda, the original Gilda, a white Creole woman and vampire who runs a brothel. Blade is brought in by Whistler, a vampire hunter who has lost his entire family. For years, they grow attached to these new parental figures, only for them to both take their own lives as a result of vampirism. The original Gilda, after growing tired in her old age and realizing that she no longer has any valuable human connection to the world, allows herself to be overtaken by the sun and by the sea. Whistler, after being bitten by a vampire, shoots himself in the head to avoid turning into one of the things that killed his family. Because of this, both Gilda and Blade have a very complicated relationship with vampirism. It gives them strength, it gives them life, it makes them who they are, but it also keeps them from the people they would otherwise love. Both of them knowing the intense responsibility that comes with just being a part of the vampiric world tend to keep other people, especially humans, at a distance and push away anyone who gets too close. They don't always succeed, of course. Blade eventually accepts that Karen will be a part of his life, and Gilda forms eternal bonds with other vampires and even turns a couple of her own. Which brings me to my next point of similarity between the two, and probably the first thing you'll notice, since it's evident in both their movie and book titles, both Blade and Gilda only have the one name. Their lack of a family name, of course, being symbolic of the fact that they both had their families taken from them at a young age, more or less. And also of the fact that their families are not just who they're related to, but who they choose to have in their life. 
there's also incredible significance of the fact that these are names they chose for themselves, although it's never explicitly mentioned how Blade got his name despite being heavily implied. <laughs> he certainly doesn't seem to mind that people call him Blade. But these are characters that presumably had names before. I say presumably because even though Blade is confirmed to have been named Eric Brooks by his mother, Gilda is only referred to as the girl before accepting her name as Gilda. But here these two characters are choosing their names, thus choosing how they're going to be remembered, and proactively deciding on the person they want to be. You have these characters embodying everything society views as predatory. Black people, black men, lesbians, and vampires to top it off. And here they are, choosing to be the good guys, saving and protecting lives, rather than taking them like society would expect. And so what Blade does is it takes that timeless question of what if vampires were real, and it follows it up with the harder hitting questions of what if a vampire could walk in the daytime, and more importantly, what if that vampire was black? And it answers this question pretty succinctly and without words. About 10 minutes into the movie, we have this beautiful scene of a white human man covered in blood, sitting in the spotlight surrounded by white police officers as Blade sneaks off in the shadows, setting the tone for the movie as the dominant white power structure in society takes responsibility for positive outcomes of this black man's labor while actively contributing to the oppressive systems that create the need for that labor in the first place. Because as we see later, the police are owned by the vampires. It is Blade's responsibility to protect the white man's innocent with this light encasing the blood-covered man representing a rebirth of sorts. You can imagine another scenario where one might be covered in bodily fluids coming out of the dark and seeing that you get the point. This rebirth imagery indicating that this man has been repurified. He is innocent again because Blade has successfully protected him from the violent actions of other white people. It is the black man's responsibility to protect the white man from himself. Later in the movie, as Blade is saving Karen from the hospital, he sees flashes of his mother when he looks at her, and as the camera zooms in on his face with each successive flashback, he makes the decision that by saving Karen, he can make up for the fact that he couldn't save his mother. And here it is that Karen becomes emblematic of black women as a whole, as she replaces cinematically the only other major black woman in the film. The scene continues with Blade picking Karen up while white police officers are actively shooting at him, willfully disregarding the fact that they might shoot Karen in the crossfire, despite the fact that officially, the only reason they're after him in the first place is because he attacked a patient and kidnapped Karen. So we see here that the police will use the victimization of black women as an excuse to hurt and kill black men, despite a blatant, uncaring attitude towards those women in literally any other circumstance. Of course, the real reason they're after Blade is because the police are being paid off by the vampires. And we see later that a different white police officer uses Karen to get closer to Blade, and conversely, Blade uses Karen as bait for that police officer in order to get closer to the vampire he's hunting. Essentially, Karen, as a black woman, at the bottom of the social hierarchy, gets used as a pawn by everyone above her until she finally gets a chance to forcefully assert her worth and importance. A plea that only really works because Whistler, a white man, voices his approval that as a hematologist, a blood scientist, she might actually be useful in the fight against vampires. And at this point, I think it's important to assert that vampires represent white people and white supremacy. Yes, there are vampires of color in Blade, but they are few and far between. And we see at about an hour and 10 minutes into the film, by the way, Frost refers to Blade as an Uncle Tom type and calls vampires the new race, that this is how vampires see themselves, as a biologically superior race that deserves to rule. Vampires are white supremacists. And if Frost attitude specifically isn't enough, there's also the incredible color symbolism of the scenes in the temple where they perform the ritual to summon the blood god. Uh, Blade is trapped in an all-black vault, and we only ever see black people enter this vault. A couple of Frost vampire goons who are black, Blade's mother Blade, and later Karen. And segregated to a different part of the temple entirely are all the vampires in this white marble room. So we see the separation of black and white not just in the skin color of the vampires and the humans, but also in the rooms themselves. And in this scene, Frost gains his power by separating himself from Blade, trapping him and stealing his blood. And of course this begs the question about vampire supremacy. If vampires are so superior, then why do they have to rely on the blood of other species? Alternatively, if white people are so superior, then why are they so reliant on the labor of other races? 
With this vampires as white supremacy symbolism in mind, the film speculates if this goes on, having a group of people reliant on the bodies of others for their own survival, quietly buying up properties and industries to continue their parasitic lifestyles into eternity, ultimately, some white man, Frost, will get too greedy and it will become everyone else's problem. Which of course only Blade, who lives between these two worlds, can solve for everyone, his half-breed status indicative of the fact that the system can't be solved from within, but it can't be fixed by someone unfamiliar with it either. And keeping Karen's hematologist status in mind, the film then ponders, if only vampires, symbolically white people, could be cured of their violence. And the answer to this is, sure, they could but only through the unpaid and largely unrecognized labor of black women. In fact, even when vampires are being exploded left and right from a serum Karen developed, it's not her serum, it's Blades. And so does it really count as the solution to white, I mean vampire supremacy, building up black men by further exploiting black women? If simply using her labor isn't enough, Blade literally drinks her blood to gain the strength to fight Frost, using not just her mind and her work, but her body too, in order to topple this symbol of supremacy. And the film will have you believe that it's worth it, that the ends do justify the means, in part because it's voluntary. Karen insists that Blade drink her blood for strength, just as she insists earlier that he use her serum to kill vampires. She does not need recognition as long as she gets results. And if giving her body to Blade saves her from having to give up her life to Frost later, then it's the only choice worth making. And so the film uses vampirism as a tool to point out problems in society, oppressive class and racial structures, greed and corruption, and it presents Blade as a solution to these problems, a way to rebalance the power dynamics. But when the movie is over, and Karen offers him a cure, there are still vampires in the world. So he elects to stay part vampire himself. It's just one last point the movie has to make about the nature of hierarchical class structures. Even heroes who seek to take down those people with the most power at the top are rarely willing to give up their own power in turn.